Hello, and welcome to Biodiesel Magazine's podcast. I am your host, Anna Simmet. We're here today with Paul Schubert, and he's CEO of Strategic Biofuels, and here to chat with us a little bit about the company's Louisiana Green Fuels Project. Uh, A little about Paul, he has over 35 years of experience in the petrochemical and renewable fuels industry, and he formerly served as COO and Executive Director of Lost Seeds. Paul, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's good to be here. So I think uh, let's start today by you telling us a little bit about the Louisiana Green Fuels Project. Um, which we ran a story about this past winter in Biodiesel Magazine. If you want to talk about maybe the products it will make, the feedstock you will use, and so on. Sure. So um, it's going to be a deeply negative um, renewable transportation fuel that we're going to produce, about actually a 400% reduction in carbon footprint relative to fossil diesel. And we think this is probably the lowest carbon footprint liquid fuel in the world. We're going to make it um, from renewable fuel standard compliant, managed, and sustainable forestry waste. It's a huge um, forestry industry in Louisiana. We'll produce about 32 million gallons per year of renewable fuel. Um, It's going to be around 87% uh, renewable synthetic diesel and about 13% renewable naphtha. Mm -hmm. We're going to produce all the power that the project needs um, from biomass, primarily from sawmill waste. Again, lots of sawmills in the area. Um, And we're going to capture the carbon dioxide from both the power generation and the fuel production. And so ultimately what we're doing is all of the carbon that's in the fuel Mm -hmm. and all of the carbon that is going to be permanently sequestered about a mile underground started out as CO2 in the atmosphere that was captured by these trees and um, stored in them in their cellulose. That is, it's so fascinating. So um, I understand, Paul, that it was a pretty bold decision to put this stratigraphic test well for carbon sequestration ahead of everything else on this project. So can you kind of talk about the goals of the test well program and why completing it was so essential to strategic biofuels plan? Sure. So the, the main source of revenue for the project really comes because of the various state and federal credits that you get because of carbon sequestration and this negative carbon footprint. For example, with the um, California Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, the more carbon negative you are, the more credits that you get. Um, Similarly, for the IRS 45Q tax credits that actually got increased in this recent Inflation Reduction Act, um, Mm -hmm. the more CO2 you sequester, the the more um, tax credit you get. So in fact, it went from uh, $50 per ton of CO2 that you sequester up to $85 per ton under the IRA. And we're expecting to sequester around 1.4 million tons per year. So that's quite a significant revenue stream. And really the only way that we could ensure that we would qualify for all these credits um, ultimately was to demonstrate that we really could do the sequestration. Mm-hmm. And when you look at it, the only way you can really make sure you can do it or prove that you can do it is to drill the test well that's required in order to get the class six well permit. That's the federal definition of this type of well for mm-hmm. sequestration. And so um, we actually took four million of the first five million that we raised to drill this test well, which um, qu- which calibrated the um, the size of the sequestration reservoir. Uh, validated all the geology that was there. And actually the results that we got were even better than we expected. So by doing this up front, we demonstrated that in fact, the goals of the project could indeed be met through the sequestration. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So Paul, talk to us about the strategy behind the CO2 sequestration in comparison to what other renewable fuel projects can do. Sure, so one of the key things is basically how much CO2 do you produce from your process and what can you do with it? So some of the technologies that produce renewable fuels have more opportunities to sequester CO2 than others. So for example, um, ethanol, there's a big project going on up in the upper Midwest to uh, put in a pipeline for CO2 for the ethanol plants. 
Well, currently ethanol has about a, a 22% reduction uh, relative to fossil fuel um, in the carbon footprint. But if you were to collect the CO2 from it, you could drop it to around 50% uh, reduction relative to fossil fuel. So that makes a pretty significant um, impact on the carbon footprint of ethanol. Mm -hmm. In contrast, soybean oil, which is probably the main source for renewable diesel right now, um, is already around 50% reduction relative to fossil diesel. And because it's an oil to start out with, the process actually doesn't produce much carbon dioxide. So if you were to sequester the amount of CO2 that was produced in this um, renewable diesel from soybean oil, you can only get about another 5% drop in the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Now for us, in the absence of any of the sequestration using this forestry feedstock, we'd have about a 75% reduction in carbon footprint, which would be very good. It'd be on the order of what you would get from like animal fats or used cooking mm -hmm. oil. Okay, but by sequestering the carbon, um, that's coming from both the power production and the fuel production will be, as I said earlier, around 400% reduction relative to fossil diesel. Uh -huh. And um, so it you know, really drives us so deeply negative. Um, and it is ultimately back to the CO2 came out of the atmosphere you know, by the power of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So Paul, without getting too deep into the weeds, can you talk a little about the um, the technology, how it works for converting forestry waste into clean burning renewable transportation fuels? So when we start with this forestry waste, um, we're going to take it and the first thing that we do is convert it to carbon monoxide and hydrogen using a process called gasification. Mm -hmm. This is a really old process. It was originally used back nearly 200 years ago to convert coal into what was called town gas. And that's what lit up towns and cities um, for many, many years before they started using other sources for lighting. Mm -hmm. um, so then we take that carbon monoxide and hydrogen and we recombine it in a process um, to produce wax and an oil. The process is called the Fischer-Tropes process. Mm -hmm. This is about a hundred year old process and really was developed um, in Germany um, at the beginning of the 1900s because the whole world was converting from a coal economy to an oil economy. And Germany had lots of coal, but no oil. Well, this wax and oil that are produced from the Fischer-Tropes process are then converted to a true pure synthetic diesel fuel using standard refinery processes. And, and indeed this is um, synthetic diesel fuel, it's not biodiesel. Mm -hmm. So can you make sustainable aviation fuel instead of, or say in addition to renewable diesel? Um, yes, we could do that. And we would expect to do that in subsequent plants. However, we already have an offtake agreement in place that would buy all of the fuel that we'll produce and all of the credits that we will produce. And currently we can get a better price from that than we would um, from SAF. So mm -hmm. the plan for this plant is diesel. But uh, again, later we will do something different in the other plants. Got it. So when do you expect construction to begin? And when do you think the plant might begin operation? Um, actually, the construction at the site will begin here in the next couple months because the Port of mm -hmm. Columbia, where this plant is going to be located, they got a grant um, from the state in order to upgrade the road that leads into the plant to um, heavy construction grade. Okay. However, when you look at the actual construction of the plant itself, um, we expect to begin around the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024. Mm -hmm. And we expect the plant to go into operation towards the end of 2026. Okay. So let's switch gears just a little bit. Um, Paul, can you tell us um, some about the forestry industry in Louisiana and the materials that you'll be using as a feedstock? We've seen that you've said about 500 to 700 seedlings of yellow pine are planted per acre. Sure. So if you look across the U.S. South, there's around 40 million acres of plantation pine forest. And these are used primarily to produce lumber for home construction and similar uses. Now, they've been doing this managed sustainable forestry in Louisiana for 
over 100 years. And they do plant around 500 to 700 seedlings per acre. But because the trees compete with each other um, for the sunlight, the nutrients, and the water, they have to do some planned thinnings. And they're going to reduce that number ultimately down to about 80 to 100 trees. And that's what you need to do in order to have the diameter and the height to economically produce the lumber. Mm -hmm. Now, typically, they're going to reduce it in two planned thinnings. The first thinning is after about 10 to 15 years of growth. And these trees are planted in nearly perfect rows. And so they will go through and they'll strip out maybe every um, third, fourth, or fifth row of trees. Mm -hmm. And then about seven to 10 years later, they will then go and reduce that down to that 80 to 100 uh, trees. And so it's these thinnings um, from the forest, they're called pre-commercial thinnings, mm -hmm. that are eligible for um, us to get credit under the renewable fuel standard. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So what's the strategy behind choosing this northern or in northern Louisiana? Well, there's three things that were really essential. So first, you had to have the right geology. So mm -hmm. you had to have a, this carbon storage reservoir, which means there has to be an upper layer that's just impervious to, um, to the CO2 leaking out, and that's there. And to meet the California credits, you actually have to have a, a bottom layer also so that you sandwich the CO2 that's going to be stored between those two layers. And that geology is present in actually many areas in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And then Louisiana has this abundant, sustainable managed forestry. And in fact, most people, and surprisingly, even in Louisiana, don't realize that the number one agricultural product in Louisiana is forestry product. Interesting. And then the third thing, um, really, and this is, um, it, there are other places that have the other two, but, um, the legislative and regulatory framework in Louisiana is probably the best um, in any state. Mm -hmm. There are only seven states that have actually defined so far who has the right to store the CO2 underground. These are called the poor rights. So mm -hmm. the space between the, the grains of, um, of rock that are deep for where we are, about a mile underground. And the state of Louisiana determined in 2009 that they belong to the surface owner rather than the mineral rights owner. And actually all seven states that have made a finding on this have determined that it belonged to the surface owner. And this is in part because mineral rights are about extracting minerals, and this is putting CO2 in and storing it. It really doesn't interfere with the right to extract it. Mm. The second thing then that they did in Louisiana was they um, – established that carbon sequestration is in the public interest. So really, back in 2009, they were very visionary in this regard. And so they established that there is an eminent domain right, therefore, for projects like ours to secure those poor rights. Now, that's yes. essential for a project because it means that no individual surface owner could block you from um, from putting in a sequestration project. Mm -hmm. So over the, say, 30-year life of the project, um, the CO2 that we're going to store about a mile underground, it will spread out about a mile to a mile and a half in radius from that injection site through this Class 6 well. Mm -hmm. And so you have to secure all those rights from the individual um, surface owners. And, of course, somebody could, you know, could potentially block it or or hold out for you know exorbitant fees. So right. just make sure that that doesn't happen. And then the third thing, and this is significant, is that these um, sequestration wells and the CO2 underground require long-term testing. So under the federal requirements for the Class 6 well, they require 50 years of monitoring after you put the last CO2 underground. And California, to get the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard credits, requires actually 100 years of monitoring. And so the, what the state of Louisiana did was set up a, a program where out of the first six years of operation, they'll take $5 million, they'll put it in a fund, um, mm -hmm. so that once you put the CO2 in the ground and, and stop doing any more, 
and gone through the, an extensive program to make sure that it's going to stay there, then the state will take over monitoring of the wells. So all of these three things, the geology, the forestry, and then this really special set of um, legislation really established an ideal location for doing a carbon sequestration project like ours in northern Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, a project like this is obviously a huge undertaking. Let's, um, can you talk a little bit about your primary partners? Who are they, um, such as engineering, procurement, and construction services? Sure. So that's going to be done by Coke Project Solutions, a, a portion of Coke Industries. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a, a term sheet, an agreement, basically, that they're going to um, give us a lump sum turnkey price. And that includes liquidated damages for delays and performance. Um, we've got Hatch, which is the largest Canadian engineering company, doing the engineering and design for the refining section for the utilities and all the off-sites. Mm -hmm. um, we've got ESI of Tennessee. They're doing the design of the biomass power plant um, that'll produce the uh, electricity that we need to run the whole facility. Now, once um, we get to the um, financial investment decision or notice to proceed, Hatch and ESI that are doing engineering for us now will become subcontractors to Coke. Similarly, the, the actual construction at the plant is going to be done by a group called Performance Contractors. They're a Louisiana-based company. They've done huge projects um, all around the world. Mm -hmm. And then we've lined up for operations and maintenance um, Crossbridge Energy Partners. Okay, thank you. And my final question for you, can you talk about the impact of this project on the community? So, you know, we're in Caldwell Parish, which is in northern Louisiana, and is actually in the seventh poorest congressional district in the U.S. And it's really um, incredibly low income, so that the annual household income, now this is like two, two um, earners, is just $36,000 per year. And Caldwell Parish, uh, where we are, is even poorer than that at just $32,000 per year annual household income. And so we're going to be bringing in, um, we estimate uh, initially 151 jobs, permanent jobs at the site with an annual salary of between sixty-eight dollars and $69,000 per year, not counting benefits. And um, so this has a huge potential impact. And then when you look at what are called indirect jobs, those are jobs that are created to support you know, the plant and the personnel, things like restaurants and tire stores and other things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting about 750 of those jobs. And you know, the community, actually, the parish has less than 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be drawing people from the um, entire region, uh, the neighboring parishes. And um, we've already established that there are going to be training programs, both at the uh, local community college level, um, mm -hmm. actually down into the high school level, and performance that we talked to earlier, they're actually going to bring people in to train people for construction. Because during construction, there's an estimated 635 jobs on average over a 31-month construction schedule with peaks up to 1,500 jobs. Now, they'll bring all the people that they absolutely have to have. But if they're people that are willing to be trained to do those jobs, they want to bring them in. We want them to hire from the local community. Right. Probably one of the things we're, we're most proud of where we've already had an impact that's significant is that um, Hatch, again, our engineering partner that we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, they came to uh, Columbia. They saw what was going on in Caldwell Parish and the poverty and the, the opportunity um, they had to actually make a difference in the community. And that's one of their core values and ours as well. And they actually began a STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math in the Caldwell Parish schools. Now, it's a robotics program. They're going to have it mentored, or it is already started. They're mentoring it with their young Canadian engineers um, who have participated in a similar program during their career. And 
these um, engineers who are doing this mentoring really are interacting directly with the students. Mm -hmm. They're giving these students from a poor community this international exposure that they never could have had. Mm -hmm. And Hatch actually has made a three-year commitment for both the mentorship and they've put up funds to support the project to buy computer resources and other resources that the school would need to effectively operate this program. Mm -hmm. And originally it was focused on um, the senior high school and junior high school. And it's had great participation already. But um, one of the things that the parish schools did was to leverage it all the way down into the elementary grades. And so it's been a great program that's been kicked off by Hatch and something that um, people recognize within the community and especially for education that um, the project is already bringing this benefit to the community. That's so wonderful. Thanks, Paul. Um, you know, with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, it has been absolutely fascinating to learn more about strategic biofuels and this project. And I really want to thank you for sharing your perspective and goals with us. And I sure hope you'll join us again in the future for um, an update, Paul. Oh, definitely. And thanks so much for the opportunity to, um, to share with you what we're doing. Absolutely. And to our listeners, Thank you so much for tuning in to the Biodiesel Magazine podcast. If you're interested in being a guest, please reach out. Until next time, be well.